The Battle of the Rhone Crossing was fought in autumn of 218 BC during Hannibal Barca's approach to the Italian Alps, when an army of the Gallic Volcae tribe attacked the Carthaginian army on the east bank of the Rhone. Acting on behalf of a Roman army camped near Missalia, the Volcae intended to prevent the Carthaginians from crossing the Alps and invading Italy. Before crossing the river, the Carthaginians sent a detachment upriver under Hanno, son of Bomilcar, to cross at a different point and take position behind the Gauls. Once the detachment was in place, Hannibal began to cross the river with the main contingent of the army. As the Gauls massed to oppose Hannibal's force, Hanno attacked from behind, leading to a route of the Volca army. This battle was Hannibal's first major battle and victory outside of the Iberian Peninsula and gave him an unopposed path to the Alps and into Italy. Chapter 1 – Background Chapter 1 – Section 1 – Pre-War The First Punic War was fought between Carthage and Rome primarily for supremacy on the Mediterranean island of Sicily and its surrounding waters, and also in North Africa. The war lasted for 23 years, from 264 until the 241 BC Treaty of Lutatius in which Carthage evacuated Sicily and paid an indemnity of 3,200 talents over ten years. Four years later, Rome seized Sardinia and Corsica and imposed a further 1,200 talent indemnity. The seizure of Sardinia and Corsica by Rome and the additional indemnity fueled resentment in Carthage. Polybius considered this act of bad faith by the Romans to be the single greatest cause of war, with Carthage breaking out again 19 years later. Shortly after Rome breached the treaty, the leading Carthaginian general Homilcar Barca led many of his veterans to expand Carthaginian holdings in southeast Iberia. Carthage gained silver mines, agricultural wealth, manpower, military facilities such as shipyards, and territorial depth, which encouraged it to stand up to future Roman demands. Homilcar ruled as viceroy and was succeeded by his son-in-law, Posdrubal, in the early 220s BC and then his son, Hannibal, in 221 BC. In 226 BC, the Romans and Carthaginians signed the Ebro Treaty, declaring the Ebro River as the northern boundary of the Carthaginian sphere of influence. A little later, Rome made a separate treaty with Saguntum, well south of the Ebro. In 218 BC, a Carthaginian army under Hannibal besieged, captured and sacked Saguntum. In spring 219 BC Rome declared war on Carthage. Chapter 2 – Roman Preparations and Strategy As Hannibal had anticipated, Rome expected the Carthaginians to fight a defensive war with minor attacks in Sicily and therefore planned to attack both Spain and Africa. Understanding that a simultaneous strike against both Spain and Carthage at the earliest opportunity would give Hannibal the opportunity to defeat their armies in detail, they planned first for Scipio to engage Hannibal either north of the Ebro or east of the Pyrenees or the Rhone, where he could receive aid from allied Iberians or Gauls and after Scipio had located and engaged Hannibal's forces, Sempronius, stationed in Sicily, would invade Africa. Due to the size and defences of the city of Carthage, a it would take the Romans several moths to starve the city out through siege and blockade. Additionally, relief armies would have to be beaten off during the siege. Since 241 BC, Rome had not negotiated but instead dictated terms to Carthage, which had always backed down. The Romans most likely expected that Carthage was bluffing by refusing to accept terms and would capitulate as soon a Roman army blockaded the city, or roused the Numidians and Libyans to rebel against Carthage. Carthage came close to capitulation in 256-55 BC when Marcus Attilus Regulus invaded Africa, and if Scipio could keep Hannibal away from Africa long Sempronius could repeat the feat or the opponents of Barsids, some of whom had relations with Roman senators might assume power or trigger the recall Hannibal and accept Roman demands. The Roman navy had been mobilized in 219 BC, fielding 220 quinquerums for the Second Illyrian War. It was the long-standing Roman procedure to elect two men each year, known as consuls, to each lead an army, 
and Rome in 218 BC decided to raise two consular armies and strike simultaneously at Iberia and Africa. Consul Tiberius Sempronius Longus received four legions with instructions to sail for Africa escorted by 160 quinquerums. Publius Cornelius Scipio, the other consul, for 218 BC, received orders from the Senate to confront Hannibal in the theatre of the Ebro or the Pyrenees. And received four legions and was to sail for Iberia escorted by sixty ships. His brother Nias accompanied him as a legate. The consuls took office in March and began organizing their forces, however, before Scipio's army was ready, the boy and the Insubas, two major Gallic tribes in Cisalpine Gaul, antagonized by the founding of several Roman colonies on traditionally Gallic territory, and perhaps enticed by agents of Hannibal, attacked the Roman colonies of Placentia and Cremona, causing the Romans to flee to Matina, which the Gauls then besieged. This probably occurred in April or May of 218 BC, the Roman Senate prioritized the defense of Italy over the overseas expedition, and Praetor Peregrinus Lucius Manlius Valsa marched from Ariminium with 600 Roman horse, 10,000 allied infantry and 1,000 allied cavalry, detached from Scipio's army, towards Cisalpine Gaul to aid the besieged Romans. Chapter 2 Section 1, War in Cisalpine Gaul the army of Manlius marched from Ariminum towards Matina, and was ambushed, twice on the way, losing 1,200 men and six standards, although they relieved Matina, the army fell under a loose siege a few miles from Matina Tanatum. The Roman Senate now took one Roman and one allied legion from the army of Scipio again and sent it to the Po Valley under the command of Praetor Obonius Gaius Attilius Sirenus. As Attilius neared Tanatum, the Gauls retired without battle, and the Romans spent the summer of 218 BC recovering and fortifying Placentia and Cremona, probably in a two-month-long operation. Sempronius remained in Rome until June-July, his army acting as a strategic reserve should more troops be needed in Cisalpine Gaul, Rome did not respond to the Carthaginian naval raids against Sicily and Lipari. Hannibal's passivity and non-threatening defensive dispositions during March to May probably influenced this decision by reinforcing the Roman perception, they were fighting a repeat of the first war and the initiative lay with them. The Romans did not believe Hannibal would invade Italy, when they received news, probably in July, that Hannibal had crossed the Ebro, they probably assumed Hannibal's Catalonia campaign was part of securing Spain by subduing pro-Roman tribes and creating a forward base. The Senate did not change the plan, Sempronius moved his forces to Sicily as planned, where he continued to prepare his African expedition at Lilibium and defend Sicily and Italy from several Carthaginian naval raids. Scipio raised and trained two Roman legions and awaited for allied troops to arrive in Rome to replace the troops taken from him, and thus could not set out for Iberia until September. And as a result, the departure of Scipio was delayed by two to three months. Chapter 3, Punic Preparations and Strategy During the First Punic War, the Romans dictated the pace of the war by taking the initiative and attacked Carthaginian positions, Carthage normally reacted to the Roman attacks. Hannibal planned to carry the war overland to Italy to deter the expected Roman invasion of Spain and Africa, and dismember the Roman Confederation. Hannibal's overland approach to Italy was a high-risk strategy, failure might have cost Carthage the war, but he was forced to choose this option given the strategic limitations the Carthaginian Empire faced in 218 BC, and one which had a chance of succeeding. An overland invasion would have the advantage of surprise, while sailing to Italy might have been faster and safer from hazards of a land march, but Roman naval dominance increased the risk to Hannibal's large armada, as it risked suffering crippling losses from Roman naval attacks despite Carthaginian warship escorts, and ships can also be lost in storms en route to Italy, fleets normally sailed along the coast and beached at night or after every two-thirds days for victuals. Carthage had no bases on the coast between the Balearic Islands and Italy, which were dominated by Roman Ali Missalia and her colonies and wild Ligurians, and Rome controlled Sardinia, Corsica, and Sicily, and thus effectively controlled the coast between Spain and Italy, thus a sea voyage would have been more dangerous than a land one, lastly, 
Enough horse transports to carry 9,000 horses to Italy might not have been available for Hannibal. Hannibal needed to time his movements carefully to keep the Romans in the dark. If the Romans got hint of his intentions, they had enough recourses to fight a multi front war by sending one army to block his army at the Pyrenees, stationing a strong force in Cisalpine Gaul, and invading Africa with another, or stand on the defensive with overwhelming forces. After the successful conclusion of the siege of Saguntum, Hannibal did nothing to provoke the Romans after the fall of Saguntum, dismissed his army and did not immediately march for Italy in the spring of 218 BC after he received the news of war. He spent the months of March to May strengthening the defense Spain and Africa by garrisoning these areas which were not threatening to Roman mainland and served a dual purpose, along with securing the areas against the expected Roman invasion it also reinforced the Roman perception that Carthage would fight a defensive war along the lines of the First Punic War so the overland invasion caught Rome off guard. Chapter 3 Section 1 – Carthaginian Deployments Hannibal stationed Hosdrubal Barker, his younger brother at the head of 12,650 infantry, 2,550 cavalry and 21 elephants to guard the Carthaginian possessions south of the Ebro. Hannibal sent 20,000 Iberian soldiers to Africa, and 4,000 soldiers garrisoning Carthage itself, probably between March-May. Hosdrubal and Carthage could raise additional soldiers if needed to fight Romans, and Carthage was unlikely fall to a singular consular army in a few months. Hannibal left Cartagena Cartagena probably in late May or early June, timing his departure to allow the spring flooding of Spanish rivers to subside, ensuring the availability of food and fodder along the way, and after receiving envoys from Gallic tribes from the Po Valley, who assured him of their willingness to cooperate against the Romans. Hannibal's army consisted of either 90,000 foot and 12,000 cavalry, or 77,000 foot and 10,000 horse, or with 26,000 foot and 10,000 horse, and 37 elephants. The elephants were reported by Appian, there is no mention of the elephants by Polybius or Livy, so it has been speculated that the elephants may have been carried to Emporia by sea. The Iberian contingent of the Punic navy, which numbered 50 quinquerums and 5 triremes, remained in Iberian waters, having shadowed Hannibal's army for some way. The army probably marched in smaller columns along a 5 to 7 miles long stretch and the 290 mile march to the Ebro, during which they crossed the Succor River and five major streams was uneventful, and the river was reached in the middle July. Chapter 3 Section 2 – Carthaginian Campaign Across the Ebro The Carthaginian army crossed the Ebro River in three columns, the northernmost crossed at the confluence of the Ebro and Sicaris River and then proceeded along the river valley and into the mountain countries, the central column crossed the Ebro at the Epidum of Mora and marched inland, the main column under Hannibal, along with the treasure chest and elephants, crossed the Ebro at the town of Ediba, and proceeded directly along the coast through Torico, Bersino, Gerunda, Emporii, and Illiberis. The separate detachments marched in a way to provide mutual support if needed, and the coastal detachment under Hannibal was also tasked with countering any possible Roman intervention. Hannibal spent the months of July and August of 218 BC crossing the 200 miles from the Ebro River to the Pyrenees, conquering the area by campaigning against the Illegites, perhaps not the Illegites at Lerida who were pro Carthaginian, but another obscure tribe between Torico and Bersino. The Bargusii at Serga Valley, the Orsetani at between Vish and Girona, along with the Laestani, the Aeronisii, and the Andosini tribes. Hannibal stormed a number of unspecified cities, and this campaign aimed to subdue region as quickly as possible, leading to heavy Carthaginian casualties. After subduing the Iberian tribes, but leaving the Greek cities unmolested, Hannibal reorganized his army. A general named Hanno, who had been identified various authors as Hannibal's nephew, a brother, or no Barsid relation, garrisoned the newly conquered territory north of the Ebro with 10,000 infantry and 1,000 cavalry, and based himself to specifically watch over the Bargusii, a pro-Roman tribe. Hanno also guarded the communication line with Hosdrubal Barker, and the heavy baggage left by Hannibal near a camp at Sissa. Hannibal next released 3,000 Carpitani soldiers, 
along with 7,000 other warriors of dubious loyalty, so the Carthaginian army now numbered 50,000 infantry and 9,000 cavalry, and 37 elephants. The Carthaginian detachments next crossed the Pyrenees Mountains into Gaul and regrouped at Illiberis in early September of 218 BC. They probably avoided the coastal road, as it contains many forested gorges and moved either through the Col de Banyuls or Col du Perthus or Col de la Perque, avoiding the Greeks in the coast altogether. Hannibal had taken almost three months to move from Cartagena to Pyrenees. The reasons for this are probably Hannibal first waited for news of Roman deployments, and then marched slowly so the Romans had time to invade Spain and meet defeat. Also give the impression of a difficult march through Iberia to the Romans before marching for Italy. Hannibal's strategic goal of securing Spain was foiled because the arrival of Scipio to Spain was delayed by three months due to the revolt of Boy and Incibus in summer of 218 BC. Chapter 4 Prelude Hannibal had created a more mobile, streamlined, loyal, battle-hardened experienced army by shedding unwilling troops and most of his heavy baggage, which also reduced his supply and provisioning burden by decreasing the number of soldiers, pack animals and size of the baggage train but increased the need to forage. Hannibal probably now abandoned any thoughts of fighting the Romans as the season was getting late, and focused on quickly reaching Italy. Hannibal had sounded out the Volcae, the Salais and the Allobroges regarding safe passage for Carthaginian arms during prior to his departure from Iberia, and had enlisted the cooperation of the boy and incibus of Po Valley to ensure provisions and reinforcements awaited him after crossing the Alps, when he was at his most vulnerable point. The Gisati was contacted but to hide his true intentions, Hannibal only sounded out the Gauls between Pyrenees and Rhone about possible passage of Carthaginians through their lands, but not for an alliance, and the Iberians west of the Pyrenees was not courted. The Carthaginians now faced a 160 mile march through the territory of several Gallic tribes, most grouped under a confederation called the Volcae, who were divided into two subgroups the Volcae Tectosages and the Volcae Aericomissi, before they reached the Rhone River. The tribes were divided over granting Carthaginians safe passage, and as the Carthaginians regrouped, the Gauls mustered their forces and their leaders met at Russino for discussion, Hannibal met and placated the Gallic chieftains with assurances of his peaceful intentions accompanied by generous gifts, then marched past Russino unmolested, and probably marched along the future via Demisu towards Nemesis, the Volcae capital, and without any incidents reached the west bank of the Rhone by late September. Hannibal's negotiation skills and war chest was put to good use to placate individual Gallic tribes on the way, so the foraging of the Carthaginians caused no friction, supplies may also have been purchased from the Gauls as no reports exist of any fighting taking place during his march. Hannibal's army numbered 38,000 infantry, 8,000 cavalry and 37 elephants at this point. Chapter 4 Section 1, Gauls Oppose Carthaginian River Crossing the Carthaginians found a Gallic army awaiting them on the eastern bank of the river. Those Volcae who opposed granting the Carthaginians safe passage had crossed the river and gathered on the eastern bank, and they may have been joined by the Cavari, whom Massilia might have influenced to oppose the Carthaginians. The Gauls had fortified a camp on the far side of the river, and was waiting for Hannibal's army to cross. The Carthaginians rested for three days after reaching the river bank, while Hannibal contacted the neighboring Gallic tribes, and aided by their pre-existing distrust for the Romans, persuaded them to aid him in his crossing of the river. The Carthaginians purchased a number of boats that were capable of making trips at sea along with other boats slash canoes of all sorts, while the natives aided in building new boats and rafts. For two days Carthaginians commenced their raft slash boat building and gathering loudly in full sight of the Gauls, as these were designed to fix their attention away from their northern flank and focus their attention across the river, masking the flanking move Hannibal was devising against them. Chapter 4 Section 2 – Outflanking the Gauls Hannibal put Hanno, son of Bomilcar, in charge of a mobile column made up of infantry and cavalry on the third night, before starting the boat building, and sent this force north upriver under cover of darkness to find another suitable crossing place. Led by local guides, 
Hanno located a crossing about 25 miles to the north of the Carthaginian camp near an island, that divided the Rhone into two small streams and decided to cross the river at that location. His force hid and rested during the fourth day, then Hanno ordered that boats and rafts to be constructed from materials that were at hand. The Carthaginian detachment chopped down trees, lashing the logs together with reliable ropes they had brought with them from the army's stores. Some of the Spanish fighters, which composed most of his forces probably on the account of being their best swimmers, crossed the river with their shields over inflated animal skins, while others crossed the river on the hastily built boats and rafts. Hanno occupied a strong position, again concealed his detachment during the following day and then moved south on the following night towards the Gallic camp under cover of darkness. Hanno's force arrived behind a tributary of the Rhone crossed and took position on a hill behind the Gallic camp before dawn, and then gave the previously agreed-upon signal by lighting a beacon and using smoke to let Hannibal know that his force had arrived in position at dawn. The leadership qualities of Hanno and the skill and discipline of the Carthaginians are evident from the fact that they had managed to pull off this whole operation undetected and unobserved by the Gauls, which was crucial to its success. Chapter 5 – Opposing Armies Chapter 5 – Section 1 – Carthaginian army. The Carthaginian army at Rome numbered 38,000 foot and 8,000 horse, and a corps of 37 elephants. Carthage normally recruited mercenaries from various nations to augment a corps of citizen soldiers and officers, Hannibal's army was no exception, the uniting factor for the Carthaginian army was the personal tie each group had with Hannibal. The cavalry arm contained at least 4,000 Numidian, and 2,000 Iberians among the 8,000 troops, since these were the numbers had survived the crossing of the Alps to reach Italy. The balance may have come from Numidians, Iberians, Celtiberians, Lusitanians, Gaetulians and Libyan Phoenicians. The Numidian cavalry were very lightly equipped, they rode short hardy ponies which were ridden bareback, wore no armor, carried javelins and a small hide bossless shields, and a short dagger or axe for close quarters combat. The Gaetulian cavalry were equipped in similar fashion as the Numidians. Although Numidian cavalry was outclassed by Roman cavalry in close quarters fighting, they normally fought in loose groups and were excellent skirmishers. The heavier Iberian cavalry may have included Celtiberians and Lusitanians along with other Spanish tribes among their numbers. Carried round shields, swords, javelins and thrusting spears. Along with iron or bronze helmets and short purple bordered tunics, some of the cavalry may have carried small round shields, two javelins and a falcotta, and wore no body armor, while others wore cuirasses, large oval shields and a thrusting spear along with swords, acting as genuine shock troops. Celtiberian and Lusitanian horsemen wore mail shirts and carried small round shields along with javelins and slashing swords. When Hannibal reached Italy after crossing the Alps, he had 12,000 African and 8,000 Iberian infantry along with 8,000 light troops, so the 38,000 infantry present at the Rhone included these soldiers in their ranks as well. The Iberian contingent probably held Celtiberians and Lusitanians along with Iberians. The African or Libyan infantry wore helmets and mail carried circular or oval shields with a metal boss, spears and swords, which were probably modelled after the Spanish falcotta, while the light infantry wore short-sleeved tunics, carried javelins and a small round hide shield. The light infantry was used for skirmishing while their heavier counterpart probably fought in a phalanx formation, or as swordsmen. The Iberian infantry fought with four carters, wore no armor over their purple-bordered dazzling white tunics, and carried large oval shields and a heavy javelin, and often wore a crested helmet made of animal sinews, while the light infantry carried a smaller shield and several javelins. Celtiberians and Lusitanians used straight gladii, as well as javelins and various types of spears. Celtiberians wore black cloaks, carried wicker shields covered in hide or light shields similar to the Gauls used, wore sinew greaves and bronze, red crested helmets, while the Lusitanian skirmishers sinew helmets and linen cuirasses, aside from swords carried a small shield and several javelins. Aside from the Numidian, Iberian, 
Libyan and Lusitanian light troops. Hannibal also had an auxiliary skirmisher contingent consisting of 1,000 to 2,000 Balearic slingers. The Carthaginians also famously employed the war elephants which Hannibal had brought over the Alps, North Africa had indigenous African forest elephants at the time. The sources are not clear as to whether they carried towers containing fighting men. Chapter 5 Section 2 The Gauls The Gauls were brave, fierce warriors who fought in tribes and clans in massed infantry formation, but lacked the discipline of their Roman and Carthaginian opponents. The infantry wore no armor, fought naked or stripped to the waist in plaid trousers and a loose cloak, a variety of metal bossed, different size and shaped shields made of oak or linden covered with leather and iron slashing swords. Chieftains, noblemen and their retainers made up the cavalry, wore helmets and mail, and used thrusting spears and swords. Both cavalry and infantry carried spears and javelins for close quarter and ranged combat. Chapter 6 The Battle Hannibal, upon seeing Hanno's signal, immediately ordered his army to launch the boats. Hanno, upon seeing Hannibal's army launching their boats, prepared to attack the Gauls. Hannibal had planned 1,000-yard river crossing carefully, having spent five days analyzing this dangerous and risky operation from every angle, ensuring that as little as possible was left to chance. Large boats, some carrying Numidian cavalry were launched furthest upstream, while similar boats carrying dismounted cavalry crossed below them, with three or four horses in tow, tied to their boats and some horses were put on boats fully saddled and ready for immediate use, so that, once they debouched from the river, they could cover the infantry and the rest of the army while it formed up to attack the barbarians. These boats took the brunt of the river's current and buffeted the mobile infantry in canoes than were placed below them. Some soldiers may have crossed the river by swimming. Hannibal himself was among the first to cross, while the rest of the Carthaginian army assembled on the western bank and cheered their comrades while they waited their turn to cross dot the Gauls, seeing the boats being launched, massed on the eastern riverbank to oppose the Carthaginians, roaring war cries and brandishing their spears and beating their shields the opposing soldiers shouted and jeered at each other while the Carthaginians were in the midst of crossing. While Hanno began to cross the river behind the Gaul camp and organize his troops on the other bank unobserved by the Gauls. Just as the Carthaginian boats approached the river bank and the Gauls were fully focused on the Carthaginian boats, Hanno launched his corps, majority of his soldiers hit the Gauls in the flank and rear just as Hannibal's group established a foothold on the eastern bank, while a small detachment of Hanno's force, set the Gallic camp on fire. Some of the Gauls rushed to defend their camp, but the majority were paralyzes before they clashed with Hannibal's troops, then retreated pell-mell away almost immediately after light resistance from the carefully arrayed advancing Carthaginian phalanx, leaving the field to the Carthaginians. Chapter 6, Section 1, Battle Site Location Historians disagree on the specific location of the battle site, identifying various locations starting from Bourg, St. Andiel, Bouquet and Forks on the Rhone, based on different hypotheses. Polybius identified the battle site as being four days' march from the sea. Assuming a 12 to 16 kilometers march limit per day for the Carthaginian army, the site is likely between Avignon and Orange, upstream of the Durance River, based on the probable ancient coastline, which has advanced further south because of silting from the Rhone since 218 BC. Chapter 7, Romans on the Rhone While Hannibal was engaged crossing the Rhone, Publius Scipio, who could not set out from Rome before late August or early September, two to three months behind schedule due to raising fresh levies from scratch to replace the troops sent to Cisalpine Gaul, had arrived on the Rhone estuary. His army had marched 165 miles north to Pisae, from Rome, then boarded ships and sailed to the easternmost mouth of the Rhone after a five-day journey. Scipio knew that Hannibal had crossed the Ebro before he sailed and had assumed that the Carthaginians were still engaged beyond the Pyrenees, so he disembarked his troops, made camp, unloaded his heavy baggage, and allowed his soldiers to recuperate from their sea voyage. Scipio expected Hannibal to fight his way to the Rhone, and arrive exhausted and weakened, 
so he did not send out scouts to find out exactly where the Carthaginian army was as he believed Hannibal was many days' march away. He was astonished to learn from Missalia that Hannibal was already across the Pyrenees, amazed by the speed of the Carthaginian march, and approaching the Rhone. Scipio immediately dispatched three hundred cavalry along with local guides and a troop of Gallic auxiliaries hired by Missali up the eastern bank of the river, unaware that Hannibal's army was only four days' march upstream, just as Hannibal was not aware of the Roman army. Scipio still believed Hannibal was many days away, his goal was probably to locate the probably crossing sites where he could make a stand against Hannibal. Chapter 8 Crossing the Rhone Hannibal, unaware of the Roman scouts bearing down on him, began to ferry his troops, pack animals and baggage across using the boats, rafts and canoes in relays, by nightfall most of the army except the elephants had crossed over and a camp was firmly established. To ferry the elephants across, the Carthaginians constructed special rafts covered with dirt, then soldiers pulled the rafts with cables to ferry all thirty-seven elephants across over three days, it is unclear if some had crossed on the day of the battle. Some frightened animals jumped into the water from their rafts, leading to their drivers drowning in the river, but the animals managed to reach the opposite bank. Hannibal learned that a Roman army and fleet had arrived at the mouth of the Rhone, probably from the Gallic envoys who had come from the Po Valley, on the day after the battle. Hannibal dispatched five hundred Numidian horse immediately on a scouting mission to the south, then held a troop review and harangued his men, and introduced Magillus, and some other Gallic chiefs of the Po Valley to his soldiers. Speaking through an interpreter, Magillus spoke of the support that the recently conquered Padane Gauls had for the Carthaginians and their mission of destroying Rome. Hannibal then addressed the officers himself. The troops' enthusiasm was uplifted by Hannibal's inspiring address. The Numidians blundered into a force of 300 Roman cavalry from the army of Publius Cornelius Scipio and a contingent of Gallic mercenaries hired by Missalia a few miles south of the camp. In a sharp skirmish, they lost 240 men, while the Romans lost 140, the Numidians fell back to the camp, the Romans rode to the edge of Carthaginian camp scouted their enemy before successfully making it back to the Roman camp near the mouth of the Rhone. Hannibal now had the chance to attack the Romans and ensure the security of Spain, or march away towards the Alps, risking a Roman pursuit and battle in unknown territory. Hannibal had contemplated fighting the Romans but decided against it, so he may have ordered the Numidians to draw the Romans to his camp. Hannibal may have wished to give the impression that he had not fully crossed as his elephants were still on the other side, so Scipio would march to engage him, giving the Carthaginians the chance to fight on the ground of their own choosing, or march further away. If Scipio chased him, Hannibal could still ambush the Romans, if Scipio marched back, the eight-day march would give Hannibal a crucial head start towards Italy. Chapter 9, Option of Hannibal, Fight or Flight Hannibal had considered fighting Scipio, but ultimately had decided to march for Italy across the Alps, as a brilliant tactical victory might lead to a strategic defeat by forcing him to winter in Gaul. Hannibal did not know the size of the Roman army or its location, even if his total force was at par two Roman consular armies and he was vastly superior in the cavalry arm and was confident of victory, however, his soldiers were tired from the recent battle and river crossing, battle casualties would diminish his numbers and the wounded would slow down his march, and the delay might force him to winter in Gaul, risking Gallic attacks on his wakened army and running short of supplies. As Hannibal was dependent on foraging, while the Romans, now alert of this position and intention, would massing large forces in Po to attack him when he arrived in Italy, and lastly, the terrain near the river was flat and yielded no tactical advantage for the Carthaginians to exploit. Scipio also might have Gauls supporting his army and a Carthaginian defeat would have meant the end of Hannibal's invasion, so Hannibal decided to march for Alps. Publius Scipio, as anticipated by Hannibal, after his scouts reported Hannibal's location, immediately loaded his heavy baggage on his ships, marshaled his legions and with all due haste marched north to confront the Carthaginians. However, when the Romans reached the Carthaginian campsite, Scipio found a deserted camp and locals informed him that Hannibal's army was three days' march away. 
Scipio was again amazed that Hannibal decided to cross the Alps as autumn was ending, but he probably did not contemplate chasing after the Carthaginians, it might not be possible to overtake the Carthaginians as they had a sizable head start, and Scipio did not know Hannibal's route, and the Roman army was not equipped and provisioned for a winter campaign. Forced marching blindly into unknown territory to catch Hannibal risked being ambushed by Hannibal or hostile Gallic tribes. In an exhausted state, the army had a few days of supplies, all heavy baggage was in their ships, no arrangements had been made with Missalia for provisions, foraging would slow the army down and make it impossible to catch the Carthaginians, the Alps had little food or forage and the Carthaginians would have cleaned the area they passed through of food and fodder as Hannibal's men were also depended on foraging, making it impossible for the Romans to live off the land. Scipio concluded that Hannibal was heading towards Italy and turned south towards Missalia. The race for Italy had begun. Chapter 10, Aftermath, The Race for Italy Hannibal had expected Scipio to march up the Rhone to engage him, if the Romans followed after him, Hannibal would have the opportunity to ambush the Romans, if Scipio turned back to Missalia, the eight-day round trip would give the Carthaginians a crucial head start towards Italy, and should Scipio's army then head back to the Po Valley, the threat to Spain would be eliminated without fighting a battle. The day after the skirmish, Hannibal deployed his cavalry southward to screen his army from any Roman intervention, while his infantry marched north, the baggage train moved north the following day. The elephants completed their crossing on the following day, and Hannibal led the elephants, his cavalry and rearguard north to cross the Alps. Hannibal's crossing of the Alps in 218 BC was one of the major events of the Second Punic War, and one of the most celebrated achievements of any military force in ancient warfare. The exact route Hannibal took is subject to debate and discussion among scholars, in 1891, historian Theodore Aero Dodge found 350 distinct work on the subject, and in the hundred plus years since then, more opinions have emerged, and one historian, humorously commented before 1914 that he would need 100 years to cover the existing literature on Hannibal's Alpine crossing. It is known that Hannibal took an estimated four to five weeks to cross the Alps. Faced harsh conditions and attacks from Gallic tribes, losing up to 20,000 soldiers and the majority of his pack animals before he reached Italy. Hannibal did not have time to bribe the Gauls for safe passage as the season was getting late, and lost men to hostile action also, in stark contrast to the crossing of Osdrubal Barca in 207 BC, who might have paid for safe passage through the Alps. Hannibal rested his battered army for a few days, and to his annoyance, found no Gallic army with supplies awaiting to join him as the Gallic chiefs had promised. He tried to persuade the Taurini to join him, and failing that, attacked their chief town, took it after a three-day siege, and put the survivors to the sword, securing provisions for his army and Gauls now began to rally to him. Chapter 10 Section 1, Journey of Scipio Scipio had marched south for four days and embarked his army onto the fleet, then took a decision that would have major strategic impact on the war. Having failed in his mission to stop Hannibal in Spain or Gaul, he resolved to fight Hannibal to carry out his orders, but instead of going to Italy with his army, as Hannibal might have hoped, he sent his older brother Gnaeus Scipio with the bulk of his forces to Spain to establish a Roman presence and prevent any reinforcements from reaching Hannibal, also ensuring the fame and fortune of the campaign goes to the Scipio family. Publius Scipio probably had enough support in the Roman Senate to be immune from being prosecuted for deserting his army, so he with a small escort began the 1,000-mile journey to Italy to take command of the Roman forces in the Po Valley, he intended to attack the Carthaginians when they emerged from the passes, exhausted, diminished in numbers, and at their weakest. Publius Scipio probably sailed for five days from Missalia to Pisa by sea, after making a stopover at Genoa. Scipio informed the Roman Senate after reaching Pisa of the situation and his intention to take command of the Roman forces in the Po Valley. Scipio marched across Etruria and reached Po Valley ahead of Hannibal, but he did not press on to head Hannibal off at the pass. Firstly, the Roman forces available to him were not fully trained, and demoralized from their mauling by the Gauls, Scipio needed to arrange supplies for the campaign, 
he did not have adequate forces to move into hostile territory and risk being attacked and cut off by the Gauls, and most importantly, the area was unknown to Romans so Scipio did not know exactly which pass the Carthaginians were most likely emerge from. If the Romans blockaded the wrong pass, they risked Hannibal linking up unhindered with the hostile Gauls and trapping Scipio's army. Scipio spent his time organizing his army and supply chain, and despite arriving in Italy before Hannibal, reached Placentia the day Hannibal took Turin. The Senate, aware that the only organized military forces between Hannibal and Rome were four ill-trained demoralized legions, decided to raise two legions to garrison Rome, and would eventually recall Sempronius to aid Scipio, this eliminating the threat of invasion against Carthage for the next fourteen years as Hannibal had hoped. Chapter 11, Hannibal's Vanishing Soldiers Hannibal might have mobilized 137,000 soldiers before setting out for Italy. After subduing the lands north of Ebro in Catalonia, Hannibal left Hanno there with 11,000 soldiers, and released another 10,000 troops from service. Hannibal's army numbered 59,000 soldiers, when he crossed the Pyrenees. It seems that 22,000 soldiers had vanished since crossing the Ebro, without any information being available about their specific fate. On the Rhone, Hannibal had 46,000 soldiers available, another 13,000 had disappeared although the army had fought no battles between the Pyrenees and the Rhone. When the Carthaginian army finally reached Italy, it supposedly numbered 26,000. The Punic army had lost 75% of its starting strength during the journey to Italy. The cause of this drastic reduction is speculated as, large-scale desertion by new recruits, high casualties suffered north of the Ebro from direct assaults on walled towns, garrisoning of parts of Gaul, severe winter conditions faced on the Alps, and the unreliability of the figures given by Polybius. Hans Steelbrook proposed another hypothesis, Hannibal had mobilized a total of 82,000 troops, not 137,000. After leaving 26,000 in Iberia, and releasing 10,000 prior to crossing the Pyrenees, he arrived in Italy with at least 34,000 soldiers. The balance was lost in battles or to the Alpine elements. The basis of this theory is. Hannibal received no Iberian-slash-African troops as reinforcements before 215 BC, when Bomilcar landed 4,000 Numidians at Lorsai. At the Battle of Trebia, there is mention of 8,000 slingers and other light infantry of non-Celtic-slash-Gaulish or Italian origins. Given that Hannibal had at least 6,000 cavalry, 20,000 heavy infantry and 8,000 light infantry before the Gauls joined him, a total of 34,000 troops when he reached Italy. This means that the Carthaginian army had still lost 25% of its starting strength on the march to Italy. Chapter 12, Notes, Citations and Sources Chapter 12 Section 1, Sources Baker, G. P. Hannibal. Cooper Square Press. ISBN 0-8154-1050. Cottrell, Leonard. Hannibal, Enemy of Rome. De Capo Press. ISBN 0-306-80498-0. Petty, John. Hannibal's War. Sutton Publishing Limited. ISBN 0-7509-3797-1. Prevost, John. Hannibal Crosses the Alps. De Capo Press. ISBN 0-306-81070. Goldsworthy, Adrian. The Fall of Carthage. Castle Military Paperbacks. ISBN 0-304-36642-0. Bath, Tony. Hannibal's Campaigns. Barnes and Nobles, New York. ISBN 0-88,029-817-0. Goldsworthy, Adrian. Canny Hannibal's Greatest Victory. Phoenix, London. ISBN 978 
Dealbrook, Hans. Warfare in Antiquity Volume 1. University of Nebraska Press. ISBN 0-8032-9199-X. Dodge, Theodore Aero. Hannibal. De Capo Press. ISBN 0 9